Welcome to Huntsville. Good morning, my name is Alan DeLuna and I'm the Executive Vice President of the AAS and we'd like to welcome you to the 10th Annual Werner von Braun Symposium. Now, I've uh, been working with people in Huntsville since 1977 when I was doing fluid systems design at, uh, at Kennedy and so I've uh, been up and back a, a few times uh, since that time, but I've never been able to uh, speak with uh, a, a, a group of folks like you guys. So we're very happy to have you here. I'm very happy to be able to work with you. Um, I'm thrilled to death to be able to, to work with Chris Crumling and his team that put this together. We'll talk about that a little more in a couple of minutes. Uh, a couple of important things for you. The first one is Wi-Fi. We do have a... Um, a Wi-Fi network called UAH Events, and we uh, the password is Charge Your Nation. We have uh, something here that will show that. There it is. And if you forget, you can pick up a little card like this up at the registration desk that will have it for you. They gave me one because they knew about my memory. <laughs> so the uh, theme this year is Gateway in Space, Exploration, Security, and Commerce. And I was on the telecon when they decided that, and I think it's very appropriate because they found things that address all of that, and all the things they found are related to each other. So, you know, that's, uh, that's good when you have a, a conference and it can actually reflect your theme. We would like to thank uh, UAH and thank MSFC for being our uh, host uh, for these next couple of days, and we're, we'll be hearing more from them in just a minute. But we'd also like to specifically thank our sponsors that we have for this conference. And those are Aerojet Rocketdyne, the Aerospace Corporation, Boeing, Lockheed Martin, the MITRE Corporation, Orbital ATK, Northrop Grumman, uh, SpaceX, Teledyne Brown Engineering, and the United Launch Alliance. So thank you to our sponsors. Now, our, our first speaker this morning is uh, Robert Altenkirk. Uh, Dr. Altenkirk is, uh, is the uh, president of the college. He went to Purdue, then UC Berkeley, then back to Purdue. So he only had one mistake in all of that. Uh, he went to probably the college that has the most astronauts graduate from it of any other college, and that was Purdue. Uh, Old boss of mine, Mike McCauley, was there. I think uh, Culbertson from uh, Orbital ATK was there. I, I think there's four or five others that also came through Purdue. So that's, uh, that's remarkable. He created the Space Science Department here in 2013, and he spearheaded the master's program in space sciences. But where you can really see what he's been doing is when you come into the conference. I've been coming to this conference for the past couple of years, and like I said, I've been to Huntsville a couple of times. But every year I come here, there's something new on campus. There's new roads, new buildings, new facilities, innovation centers, technical centers, things for the students, and it's really gratifying to see those, these things grow here in Huntsville. And I'd like us to have, welcome Dr. Alton Kirk right now. Thank you very much. Yes, when uh, I was a graduate student at Purdue, my uh, office was in Chaffee Hall. So welcome uh, to the campus, 10th um, annual uh, Werner von Braun Symposium. And the theme this year, as you heard, uh, space exploration, security, and commerce. Our path forward is um, appropriate, given that this uh, community is a birthplace of uh, America's space program and because of the need to uh, understand and guide the direction of uh, future space exploration. So I suspect that uh, long into the future, UAH, uh, NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center, and the many contractors that populate the Cummings Research Park will continue to provide um, leadership in the advancement of uh, space exploration, security, and commerce. It's been that way for a long time, and uh, I don't see a reason that that leadership would change. So 56 years ago, uh, Werner von Braun lobbied the Alabama legislature for funding for a research inst institute uh, to be built on the campus. 
Von Braun told the uh, legislative body that, quote, by building the academic climate in Huntsville, this community believes that this area is destined to continue to grow and become a great and permanent scientific, educational, and industrial center. So Von Braun's uh, vision is being carried out every day on the campus and in the community. Forbes magazine has described uh, Huntsville as one of the world's smartest cities. We're the home of the highest concentration of scientists and engineers in the US. Number of college graduates in the community far exceeds the national average. And students and faculty are thrilled to be part of this great community. Let me uh, cite a few examples of uh, ongoing initiatives. Maximum uh, thrust capabilities of our propulsion uh, test facility has increased recently by a factor of four. We have significant involvement in developing the uh, International Space Station's lightning imaging sensor. Um, that package was uh, recently delivered to the ISS. Uh, we're working on integration of model-based systems engineering tools into modeling of uh, nuclear thermal propulsion. Gary Zank, who is the chair of the uh, Department of Space Science, led a proposal <clears throat> that resulted in a $20 million statewide NSF project focused on better understanding the physics and applications of low temperature pl uh, plasmas. We're working on the assessment of uh, next generation propulsion technologies for the Missile Defense Agency. Support of the uh, calibration of the James Webb uh, Space Telescope, uh, the mirrors in that telescope. And uh, UAH students uh, helped an innovative commercial launch provider develop its uh, next generation spark torch igniter that was successfully tested uh, on a second stage engine in the Mojave Desert. So this is a unique uh, institution that um, confronts big challenges. The students, faculty, staff devise bold solutions for issues facing the nation and the planet. So we think that UAH and Huntsville is a 21st century place. So that's a little taste of uh, what we do here, the enthusiasm, the innovation that goes on. And I'd invite each of you to come back to campus and spend more time. Um, and as was said, uh, every time you come back, you'll see something new. So thanks for coming. We appreciate your presence. And uh, I'm sure you'll have a very productive symposium. Thank you. Speaking next is Todd May, who is the center director for the Marshall Space Flight Center. He's been the center director since 2015. Uh, before that, he started as a MMP lab worker here. Then he went to the um, running the Russian uh, liaison office. He was the associate program manager for uh, Constellation. He was deputy uh, manager for uh, the uh, Sciences Mission Directorate in DC. And then he was manager of SLS. And that kind of role, he's rolling, continuing now as he drives SLS to his first launch in 2019. Now the interesting thing I found about Todd when I was going through his bio here was that he's moved a lot. Huntsville, Houston, Huntsville, Washington, Huntsville. You know, I, I suspect that his, his wife Kelly probably said, I thought you were in NASA, not in the Army. So anyway, uh, Todd's moved around a lot. He's been through the NASA organization. Now he's running the most important NASA has, the most important program NASA has in launch vehicles and the uh, most important one they've had in the past 25 years in launch vehicles. So Todd May. Thank you, Alan, and uh, thanks to AAS uh, for putting this symposium on. As a, as a member of the board, I'm a little biased, but when I, when I see the lineup over the next couple of days, I think we're, uh, we're in a really good place. This is, this is kind of like the Lollapalooza of uh, a Space Geeks. Um, I think this morning, uh, just in the first hour I've been here, I've talked to new space folks, uh, traditional space companies, students, uh, members of the media uh, and academia, 
uh, and just overall Space Geeks all in that first hour. And that's really what conferences like this are about. Um, they bring us all together and, and we throw these ideas up there. And, and you're going to hear from some great panels this week. You're going to hear from some great space leaders. Uh, General Hyten, uh, a, a, a Huntsville native, is speaking at the dinner. You've got Robert Lightfoot, uh, acting administrator, Bill Gerstenmeyer, the, the uh, the monarch of, of human space flight uh, speaking here. You've got industry partners and, um, and government folks that are running the programs that are actually making uh, exploration real, uh, inclu and, and including uh, folks that are also doing some very innovative things in space. So um, thanks, everybody, for being here. And, and thanks, Dr. Alton Kirk, for being our host. Um, you've done a great job since you've been here. The numbers are up. Um, the facilities have, have, are just amazing. I think this is the second year we've been in this new facility. It's a great setup. Um, let me just say that I, uh, I think before I say a few uh, words about what we're doing at Marshall today and what it means about the future of our national space program, I, I want to dedicate just a couple of minutes to the past. Uh, well, scratch that. I, I, I want to talk about history, um, and I, and I want to. I want to put it in, in context of the arc of history, not just the past, but the past, the present, and the future. And a few weeks ago, as I was thinking about what I wanted to say to you today, um, I realized that um, um, this is the 10th anniversary of the Von Braun Symposium, and that's a decade. And so I thought, you know, it'd be interesting to go back and kind of go back about 50 years, and, and decade by decade, um, see what was going on at the center. And so there's a... Uh, a thing that's been around about as long as building 4200 on the arson has been around, it's uh, the Marshall Star. And it's, it's got articles in it uh, every week about what's going on at the center. So I went back, and uh, since I didn't have a, a time machine, I thought I would go back and, and look at those and see what was going on. So I, went, I turned the clock back 50 years to October of 1967. Uh, I was seven months old at the time, and my LinkedIn profile had... Um, one thing I was good at, and my mom had put it in there, and it was drooling. <laughs> now it says I'm good at government. <laughs> so as I was expect, there was news about the Apollo program, including a test of the second stage uh, coming up. And, and everybody was really excited about that. It was going to be at the Mississippi Test Facility, which is now Stennis uh, Space Center. Um, there was also an article about the results of lunar regolith um, a test that was done by Surveyor 5, which was gathering data on the properties of the moon's surface, with Apollo 11 scheduled to launch in less than two years. The words and images from those 50-year-old news clips echo with the present as we work with our partners to ready the next generation rocket, the Space Launch System, for its mission to the vicinity of the moon. But I was also reminded of how much has changed during those decades, separating Marshall of 1967 with the one we know today. When I read the headline, microfish may offer oceans of storage space. <laughs> a swing and a miss there, right? <clears throat> so sometimes we don't always get the future right. Uh, I move forward a decade to 1977 and into the next chapter of Marshall and our space program. And on those pages, the stories talked about progress made on the first space shuttle's critical components, including the orbiter, and motor segment test article firings for the solid rocket booster. Again, the marshal of the past and present was linked together by a common thread. The center was on the leading edge of another era defining mission as the first space shuttle would launch in 1981 and assure our nation to maintain sustainable access to low Earth orbit. And in 1987, the headline tell the story of a paradigm shift of a marshal working with the agency to return the space shuttle to flight. I, like some of you students here today, was a freshman in college. It was no less important, though, to the story of our national space program. It was a reminder of what's at stake in our line of business and the absolutely critical nature of the safety culture and how it underwrites our mission success. And in that same October, the Marshall Star reported the findings of a workshop convened to envision the challenges of a space station. So it's not surprising that winding the clock forward to 1997, the paper describes the space station that has moved beyond the conceptual phase to the design and build of real hardware. And in October of that year, we were one year away from the first launch of the space station. 
and I couldn't help but feel a pang of nostalgia and pride and maybe a little feeling of mourning when I saw the headline, Marshall Built Mirrors Bound for Planet Saturn on Cassini. My journey concluded in October of 2007, 10 years ago, when I looked through the stories captured at that moment in time. What I saw was the twilight of the space shuttle program as the nation and the dawn of the International Space Station, a space program looking to the future that take humankind to moon, Mars, and beyond. And as I walked through the headlines of each decade past, I also walked through the process and the progress of Apollo Space Shuttle and the International Space Station and the amazing discoveries of the science missions Hubble and Chandra. From my vantage point in 2017, I could see both the successes and the failures, but also see that line of best fit curve curve steadily upward. Over that timeline, I could see all of you, the men and women, the institutions and organizations and the community that has con and continues and will always be the common thread and the key to the work we do. And when a future center director reads this year's headlines, it will tell our story including Vice President briefed on space launch system progress, places called a space station during crew visit to, Mar to Marshall. So as you may have heard in the news recently, the Vice President did visit Huntsville with Res Representative Adderholt, and he came to Marshall and he came to the Aviation Missile Research Development and Engineering Center uh, three weeks ago. And it was the first visit by a sitting Vice President or President since 1992, almost 25 years. Uh, as our team scrambled to make it happen in, in five days, including uh, a point uh, on the weekend where it was on again, off again, I couldn't help but compare it to the first visit from your in-laws. <laughs> there was excitement, there was stress, there was fear, and there was a Herculean effort to make those, the house sparkle for our visitors. And it was truly a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. The Deputy Commanding uh, General of the Army, uh, General Ed Daly, join me and we accompanied we accompany the vice president and the congressman on a tour of the payload operations and integration center the engine section test for the for the space launch system and amr deck over in, uh, on the army side and mostly it was an opportunity to show the vice president and the chair of the national space council the critical assets that are enabling nasa and its partners to execute space policy and pursue national priorities the reason I'm sharing this with you isn't just because I'm proud of what happened, I am. It's because of what the Vice President said to the first crew of ISS and then personally to me. During his call, he said, America is determined to lead once again, not just in low Earth orbit, but once again leading the world in space exploration. And before he boarded Air Force Two, the Vice President looked at me and said, we want to see this rocket fly. That's a really powerful message to the team that's been working so hard for the last five years to put this thing together. And it's not the first time the Vice President has mentioned America leading in space again. In fact, it's a message that this administration has woven into almost all of its remarks about space. The question is, what does American leadership look like when it comes to space exploration in the 21st century? The space program was born in a world where two superpowers, the United States and the Soviet Union, race to develop fundamental capabilities for spaceflight and low Earth orbit operations. Today, the United States is sharing the stage with an international community that is just beginning to flex its muscles in low Earth orbit and a growing commercial space industry that is doing the same. What we are witnessing today is a democratization and commercialization of spaceflight and space exploration. And like all technological revolutions, the phenomenon is disruptive but I believe ultimately good for our country and for humankind. The world today is a testament of the power of space exploration as a force for progress and a challenge facing NASA and the space program. As the globally accelerated development of space technologies and systems put low Earth orbit in reach of a greater number of nation states and private enterprises, our future comes into focus. American leadership is no longer defined by the ability to just build a launch vehicle that can fly, but the ability to effectively build an exploration program that puts the one once unreachable within reach of humankind, while harnessing the true benefit of space revolution of our nation. This greater purpose compels NASA 
and the National Space Program to pursue two major transformative goals. First, to expand our capabilities beyond low Earth orbit and develop foundational deep space systems and infrastructure needed to maximize the benefits of space exploration for the nation and all humankind. And secondly, to enable the safe and sustainable development of a commercial space technologies and services for low Earth orbit while ensuring that we pave the way for new markets and cooperative endeavors from the Earth to the outer solar system. The Space Launch System is not only the cornerstone of our near and long term strategy for success, but a catalyst for the future. The SLS is going to be a huge step forward in the transformation from an agency and program shaped by the space race to one that is aligned and rapidly advancing commercial and international capabilities. That means we at Marshall have to deliver on SLS as it moves closer to the launch pad and across our portfolio of programs and projects. We continue to work with our partners to ready the SLS for its first flight. And crucially, we've reached all the milestones on our critical path to the pad as our team at the Mishu Assembly Facility have worked tirelessly to complete all the core elements, including the liquid hydrogen and oxygen tank tanks for the first flight. The completed test articles have all made their way up to Huntsville where we're where we've completed some of the testing and are now starting to test the um, engine section. And as of yesterday, we started the ultimate tests on it. Almost four million pounds of force uh, of compression on the engine section. I, I, I figured that to be about a thousand cars. So imagine putting a thousand cars on top of a, one of the segments of the, of, the, of the rocket and letting them just push down on it. That's a pretty amazing uh, feat just in and of itself. Uh, those, those pieces are moving around uh, the country on the Pegasus barge, which is longer than a football field. We've also uh, been flying some of the hardware on the Super Guppy, which if you've ever seen it, it doesn't look like it should stay up in the air. It, it looks like it would fall down. We've completed a design review on the exploration upper stage and are moving now into the manufacturing phase. We've almost completed all qualification and integration testing of the avionics for the rocket stages. And the proven and powerful RS-25 continues to prove its metal with a test last week and another hot fire in the books. In fact, four RS-25s will fire together in a little over a year when we hold the green run for the rocket's core stage. When that beast is loaded into the B-2 test stand at Stennis Space Center, that assembly will become the second tallest building in Mississippi. The next stop for the core stage after that is Kennedy Space Center, where most of the rest of the rocket's going to be waiting for it. So we are making tremendous progress on the path to the pad, and the stakes will only get higher as we get closer to the rocket's first mission. It's been a long time since astronauts have launched from the American soil. And though we continue to fly in other ways, with ISS in orbit and commercial launch vehicles transporting supplies, there's something uniquely captivating about a countdown to the pad and the launch of a brave crew of astronauts. The launch pad is a spiritual symbol of the space program. It is by no means the sum of what the agency or the National Space Program does, but it serves as a bridge between the proud legacy of our past and the tremendous promise of our future in deep space. The power and scale of human spaceflight is what, and what it enables, science, innovation, and new discoveries is our flag. When SLS launches from American soil, it will signal a return to an era of bold American leadership in space exploration to history-making missions showcasing our nation's ingenuity and capacity for doing what no one else can. We are building a space program for the new millennium. And as a new commercial market evolves in low Earth orbit, and we pave the way for the first human mission beyond cislunar space. And though change can be disruptive, there is no question that this phenomenon is fueling innovation, advancing progress, and expanding the benefits, the reach for the benefits there and the benefits therein. Just imagine that moment when SLS's, uh, America's rocket for a new era, is on the pad at Kennedy Space Center preparing for liftoff. It will be a moment that propels our nation to the leading edge of human spaceflight, a return to missions that pull, put the unreachable in reach. And on that day, like those when Saturn V and the space shuttle launched from Cape Canaveral, the world will be watching and the United States will be leading by inspiration, by the dreams of what we do and discover in the years ahead. This symposium serves as a terrific vantage point 
from which to reflect on the past and to look to the future. Engineers, scientists, thought leaders, advocates, and others who are vested in the future of space exploration are brought together by this common cause. What should amaze all of us in this room is our place in this story, and it's being written today, a story that is part of a continuum filled with historic accomplishments, bravely, bravery, moments that bring out the best from our nation, our world, and our community. Thank you, and have a terrific 10th annual Werner Von Braun Memorial Symposium. First one's the hardest. Okay, I'm walking up the stairs. I'll walk down the stairs in a minute. Okay, one right up here. So what challenges keep you up at night on uh, SLS's march to the pad? What keeps me up at night? To be frank, um, nothing really keeps me up at night. I keep other people up at night. <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> I borrowed that line from General Mattis. Uh, you know, uh, I, I actually sleep pretty well. I, I, I will tell you, um, that gives me a chance to brag a little bit on the team. Um, we, we have a thing across all of federal government called the Employee Viewpoint Summary, and every government employee takes part in it. And for five years in a row, they, they, uh, they take those questions and they, they figure out where's the best place to work in federal government. And, and NASA has been that place for five years. And, uh, and Marshall, when they break it down to the subunits, is, is number 10 out of 350. And, uh, and so I'm telling you that because this year, we actually had more participation than we've ever had. And almost every one of our indicators went up. It's getting, it's getting even better. And, and what that says to me is the team is engaged, they love what they do, and they're excited about their mission. If, if that's the case, then great things are going to happen. And so I don't worry uh, at all. Um, and, and I actually do sleep, sleep pretty well. So um, nothing keeps me up at late, late at night. I, I will tell you that, that our folks actually asked Robert Lightfoot that same question. And, and his answer was, we haven't launched in a long time. And, um, and I think there's, you know, we've had a gap since the space shuttle. We haven't launched humans from American soil, be it either commercial crew or um, in deep space exploration. And, and so he's anxious to get that gap closed. Um, and so from his perspective, um, that's what we're, we're all working to help, help make happen, be it, you know, our support here at Marshall to the commercial crew companies or getting SLS ready and getting it ready for deep space missions. Good question. Yes, sir. Back in the back. Todd, if you can, I don't know if you can hear me. I'll repeat the question if I can hear it. I'll Any come up. Any insight from the Vice President's visit with the, and the Space Council meeting with the discussion of return to the moon and what that might mean? Yeah, I don't have any special insight. I, I read in the papers what you read, um, and, and so I, there does uh, appear to be uh, importance being placed on the moon. Um, you know, a, as... As most of you know, we've been looking at cislunar space anyway as what uh, Bill Gerstenmaier calls the proving ground because we believe going straight to Mars is uh, such a, such a uh, difficult prospect that you've actually got to be able to stage and, and get yourself ready for that. So I think we're, we're ready no matter what. Um, you know, the things that we're working on today will support uh, cislunar missions. I think they'll, they'd support a, a mission to the moon's surface. Um, and, and on out to Mars if, if you want. You know, my own personal thoughts about it are, I think, I think the moon is a great place to go. I think we ought to not lose sight of Mars as the ultimate goal, though. Uh, you know, I just think no matter what we do, let's not forget that ultimately we want to move out to another planet. Any other questions? Oh, yes, sir. What, Chris, right there. What's your current Here you go. date for launch now? So uh, 2019 is where we think we can get that done. We, we had an agency PMC meeting with Robert, and uh, within a few weeks, I think he intends to, to, to codify whatever that date's going to be. But um, the, the team feels like we can get the core stage developed and delivered to Kennedy um, by the end of 2018, and the rest kind of falls out from there. 
Um, you've probably read in the paper some of the challenges we've had. Um, getting the core stage welding completed was a big one. We've got that behind us now. We're having some challenges with the service module as well. Okay, one more. Let me, let me add to that, though. Um, this is the fun part. It, it's the hard part, but it's also the really fun part for the team. Um, I, I worked Space Station for 11 years, and uh, I, I worked in Houston until about a month before the FGB launched, and then I came to Huntsville, and I was over in building 4708 here when we were building the node lab and airlock. And, and we got into that phase where we were having meetings at 6 a.m., 10 a.m., 2 p.m., 6 p.m., and 10 p.m. every single day, and, and then a four-hour meeting on Saturdays. Um, John Huddycutt's here in the room, program manager. Uh, the, the president, look, or the vice president, looked him in the eye and says he wants to fly this rocket. I guarantee you um, he is now motivated to, to make it happen, and he's now having multiple meetings every day. And while the team, I'll say this, it doesn't feel fun at the time, but when I look back 15 years ago, at some of the best times of my career were getting that, those, those modules built and delivered down to KSC. And it's not fun at the time, but when you look back, it will have been the best thing you ever did. Yes, sir. Hey, Todd. Hey, um, Dan. Good morning. Hey, uh, incoming director of AIAA. Congratulations. Thank you, but that's not why I stood up. I'm intimidated. Um, I'm intimidated now. A current professor at Purdue. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I love and the my Purdue former theme. boss. Yeah, I love the Purdue theme running through this. Todd, with what you guys have been looking at, we have students here from UAH. Illinois, Purdue, and probably some others. How would you paint the picture for them and their career 20, 30 years down the road and what they have to look forward to? That's a, that's a great question. Um, so um, I mentioned that decades thing. When, when I hit 1997, it, it was about the time I was the age of some of the students here in the room. And, and I can remember um, how jarring it was because I was, um, I was a freshman when we lost Challenger. And, um, I was actually headed towards a, a test, and uh, I decided not to go take the test and watch what happened in the in the union building. It was it was a union building with a large TV, um, and uh, I, you know it's funny because at the time I didn't think I was going to be in the space business, but I can remember thinking how as a nation it pulled us all together. And it's I'll just say it's interesting now to think back to that time and realize you know how far I've come into this, where I'm actually part of this program now. Um, you know, you, you guys can be part of this. Um, and so I would tell you, you I, I've given you 50 years of an arc of history. Um, I think, um, uh, you know, one of, the, one of the best phrases I ever heard about it is that this cause of exploration is not an option we choose. It's a, it's a uh, destiny written on the human heart. There's something about what we're doing when we explore that no matter who you are, no matter when, where you are, no matter what decade you're in, we want to do that, and we want to be part of that. So if you're choosing to be in space and space exploration, I believe there's going to be a career for you, and, it, and I, I can guarantee you it will be an exciting career and one that you won't regret. So that's what I would say to them. Now, if you're asking what should they study, um, there, you know, it's, a, it's an emerging field. I will tell you there's always a need for good systems engineers. And by good systems engineers, I don't mean those who have just had systems engineering classes, but those who think across discipline boundaries and know how to solve complex problems. Um, you know, and, and I would say experiential learning is really good. So if you have a, a, a rocket club or a, a car club or something where you have to work together as a team and strive for a goal and compete, um, those are really good beyond the classroom to prepare you for the kind of stuff you're going to have to do when you get out. Okay, good. Any, any Thanks, okay, thank you. All right, so back in uh, late 2001, early 2002, there was a, a young engineer, at least he's younger than he is now, they had the uh, audacious idea of worrying that we needed something other than the space shuttle to be able to supply the ISS. And so he went off and created a program called AAS, Alternate Access to Station. Um, I got to work with him because he needed somebody from the ISS program office and I was uh, working for USA who was the contractor for the ISS program office. 
So I became the JSC rep, and he was a marshal rep to go off and put together this program called AAS. And that program created the requirements over about a two-year period in four big major studies with four major aerospace corporations. We created the baseline and the requirements that became a program called COTS, Commercial Orbital Transportation System, which turned into CRS, Commercial Resupply, which turned into Commercial Crew. Uh, the uh, chairman of this uh, conference this year is Chris Crumley. He's currently the Vice President for Business Development for Teledyne Brown for Commercial and Civil Space. Uh, between uh, around 1996 and today, he's been in government uh, two or three different places. He's been in a couple of companies. He's been in propulsion, in program, in business development, uh, in legislative affairs. So he was a great chairman, able to pull together all of the folks that we needed to put this conference together. And it was really gratifying to be able to sit in the telecons on the uh, conference and, and listen to the people work together to develop the program that we've had. And it was done, I thought we were going to have telecons every week for about three months. And we ended up having about six telecons. Maybe a few more, but not too many. So Chris Cromley is the uh, chairman of the conference. Chris, come forward, please. Well, thank you, Alan. Uh, thank, and welcome, everybody, to uh, Huntsville. Um, I was uh, trying to steady myself this morning, knowing that this was the 10th annual and everybody likes a round number, and I kind of comforted myself with, uh, with a prayer, and it was the, uh, the, the uh, Alan Shepard serenity prayer. I said, oh, Lord, please don't let me up this up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we did have a really good crowd uh, that worked with us uh, on planning this, and, uh, and I was lucky to be a servant leader on, on pulling all this together. Uh, there's a, everybody is on, you see on the screen and it's on the back of your program. A couple of people that uh, I don't think that we put on there is Jim Kirkpatrick, a uh, longtime uh, executive director of AAS, started this off and then he handed off to uh, who we called the other Jim. And it's about to flip over and you guys are going to meet Jim Way and he's a, he's a wonderful, a wonderful individual and a great leader and we're, we're really lucky to have him. Um, we also had uh, Andy Johnston, and uh, we didn't put him in the program, and you probably won't see him because he's preparing for the other event that's coming up Thursday night, the Von Brown Dinner, both of which are, are uh, this, this conference and the dinner are both sellouts. And it's, um, I think it's going to be the largest crowd, Lisa, that we've ever had in the, in the uh, Davidson Center for this. And uh, it's, uh, re it's really going to be something. Um, get close to a screen so you can watch the program. Uh, but it'll, it'll be really nice. Uh, we also have uh, Lara Fry with SMDC. You notice that we have uh, tried to move in a little bit more into our national security space, and we'll have a little bit of that into this program. So we're, we're lucky to have had a, a good many people come in and, and help plan. But over my career, um, having um, led several things and uh, been involved, uh, there's two people that I rely on and uh, have been with me to, to help me along this path, and I just want to identify them. One's Gene Goldman, uh, a quiet leader uh, that you, uh, you, you'll, you'll be a treasure to be around. And the other one is Charles Scales. Um, we would have these telecons, and I would uh, immediately call Charles. I said, is everything okay? Did we do okay? Are we, are we on the way? And he's always been a comfort to me. And, uh, and those, those two people, if you ever get a chance to be around them and uh, to work with them, uh, really it, it'll be a joy. And, uh, and they, they've been, been great stewards of what we've been putting together. But enough about that. We're here. We're getting ready. We're getting ready for our first panel. And I want to introduce our first uh, chairperson for the panel. And it is Lawrence Dale Thomas. Dale is currently a professor and eminent scholar of systems engineering in the Department of Industrial and Systems Engineering. Here at the University of Alabama in Huntsville, but I've worked with him for many years at NASA. And he's been to a, a lot of places in NASA as well. Um, you would think that people in NASA just can't hold a job because they move us around quite a bit, but uh, Dale has been back and forth, and, uh, and I think he's been better for it. Uh, he serves as director of the Alabama Space Grant Consortium, deputy director of the UAH Propulsion Center, and prior to his retirement in NASA in 2015, he was our associate center director technical for the NASA Marshall Space Flight Center, providing technical leadership in all Marshall Space Flight projects. So Dale is going to lead our exploration update. Dale, I'll invite you up, and then you can bring up your, uh, your panelists, and uh, we'll get started with our next session. Dale Thomas. I'd like to 
to ask the panelists uh, to go ahead and come down uh, while y'all pull up uh, the chart deck. And while that's happening, um, I just want to uh, say how much I enjoyed Todd May's talk. And, you know, I've worked with Todd uh, over the years, and his mental acuity has just always blown me away. Uh, I, Jody was working on his uh, talking points for today, and, you know, she sent them out to me, and I reviewed them. And, you know, uh, when he was giving you that analogy on uh, how many cars to stack on the structure, I happen to know that Jody had worked that up in the number of elephants. Todd, being from Auburn, could not get elephants out of his mouth. <laughs> so he just real time up here figured how many cars that was going to be and switched that analogy on the fly. And probably none of y'all knew that. You know, Great job, Todd. Right. So, so yeah, uh, we're going to do the exploration update today. When, when Jim Way called uh, and, and asked me to do this, uh, so... He will, I think it took me all of five minutes, you know, to tell him yes, and that's just because he was trying to talk me into it. And as soon as he stopped to take a breath, I said, okay. Because uh, one of the toughest things about retiring from NASA was having to get out of the game. Uh, as Todd alluded to, the, the build-up to a launch is about as good as it gets. And uh, walking away from that was very hard. And uh, walking away from working with these guys on a daily basis is very, very hard. We've got a great panel uh, put together up here. So uh, the theme of the talk today is going to be uh, the power to explore. And this is our panel today. Uh, it includes uh, Bill Hill and Mike Bolger and Mark Kirisich and John Honeycutt. And I'll be sort of moderating, you know, with my hand on the the throttle, you know, with a very light touch, guys. Uh, it's your show. A uh, couple things I want to say, you know, uh, Todd made the analogy, you know, that we're two years out. And when you think about 2019, it is going to be an awesome year. All right. Uh, when you think about July of 2019, 50 years since Apollo. All right. James Webb Space Telescope is going to launch in 2019, giving us a look back to the very origins of our universe. And what we're going to talk about here today, SLS is going to launch in 2019. It's, it's going to be awesome. And I know these guys are going to tell you, and I know they feel, 2019, two years, you know, for the college students, seems like a really long time. For these guys, two years is the day after tomorrow. That's the way it feels, right? So, um, one of the hats I wear as director of the Alabama Space Grant Consortium, as uh, Chris mentioned, uh, we already took a busload of students down to watch an engine firing at Stennis uh, back in May. We were planning to take another busload down in December, if I can get the date coordinated uh, with Steve Wofford, uh, to watch a, an engine firing. Uh, we have to time it between semesters, John. And uh, then we're also planning, and this one's going to be a little logistically challenged, but we're going to uh, take at least one busload of students from Alabama uh, to the Cape during 2019 to see the integration of SLS in the VAB. So we'll get to see Orion, SLS, and the, the ground facilities there at the Cape. And, uh, you know, I'm looking forward to seeing it, and I know the students who will get to go with us, it'll be something that they'll never forget. So... Uh, it's going to be a very exciting time. I'm looking forward to it, and you're going to be looking forward to it as well. And I'm going to quit talking and get started with a panel. So first up, and by the way, the way we're going to take this is from the ground up. So we'll start with Mike Bolger, and then John Honeycutt will talk about the SLS, then Mark Kirsich about the rocket, and then John, excuse me, and then Bill Hill is going to tie everything together. All right? So the first speaker up will be Mike Bolger. Mike is the program manager of ground systems development and operations at Kennedy Space Center in Florida. Uh, in that capacity, he's responsible for leading the 2,000 member team of government and contractor personnel, preparing Kennedy's facilities, ground systems, infrastructures, processes uh, to get ready to launch the Space Launch System and uh, Orion vehicle 
to take U.S. astronauts on exploration missions into deep space. Mike Bolger graduated from Indiana University in 1987 with a B.S. in computer science, with a major in computer science and a minor in mathematics. And he earned his master's in business administration from the University of Central Florida in 1999. So please, let's give a warm welcome to Mike Bolger. Mike, you, I'll bring this over here so y'all can talk from here. Okay. okay, thanks, Dale. You know, the ground never gets to go first. This is, this is great. Usually by the time you get to the ground, there's about a minute left in the program and we rush through everything. It's so the way I look at it is I got about an hour here. And I'm going to finally tell that ground story. You've got to save time for curious. <laughs> no, that's right. We've got, we got to save time for Mark. Okay, um, so yeah, so I'm Mike Bolger. I'm the program manager at Kennedy, and um, our, our team is busy readying the, the launch infrastructure. We're, we're putting together, or we're doing the construction of the facilities. We're finishing up our ground systems. We're working hard on software, um, and we're getting the launch team ready so that when the flight hardware shows up, um, that, that we're, we're ready to go for it. This first picture is a picture of the crawler transporter. It's crawler transporter number two, um, the crawler transporter that's been used um, through the Apollo program, through the shuttle program. Um, for this program, we, we have um, strengthened it um, we, you know, another, for the additional weight of the SLS and the Orion, and we have also done a number of 20-year mods to it. Every 20 years, we kind of go through a, a set of mods. Um, among the things that we've done, we've replaced roller bearings, we've replaced gears and gearboxes, we've upgraded our hydraulic systems, and Crawler Transporter 2 that you see the picture of here is rare and to go. It, it, the, the mods are finished, and it's ready. And it actually, um, is, what it does is it carries the mobile launcher and the rocket, um, from the vehicle assembly building out to the launch pad. So we, we call it the first four miles of the journey to Mars. Um, it, it doesn't move as fast as, um, as Todd and the rocket. W once they get it off the pad, we go about a half a mile an hour. So that first four miles is about an eight-hour eight hour trip to the pad. But that's the first four miles of the journey to Mars. So if we go to the next slide, what I'm going to do is just kind of run through some of the major facilities and mods. And Oh, I got it. Sorry. Went too fast. Let's see. Okay, so um, this is a picture inside the multi payload processing facility, or the MPPF. This is where we do the Orion servicing and deservicing. So these are some of the stands inside the clean room. Um, the work here is done, the construction work, the ground systems are all in place. We're in the middle of our verification and validation activities. Um, we'll finish those up um, early, what, spring, spring next year, and we'll be ready when Mark shows up with the Orion. This is a picture of the launch equipment test facility. Um, it's a facility out behind our, uh, our operations and checkout building in the industrial area of the Kennedy Space Center. I'm going to spend a minute talking to you about it, and then I'm going to hopefully show you a video here of, of an um, umbilical arm in action. If you kind of start at the right side of the picture, you can see some structure um, that simulates what the mobile launcher tower looks like. So that's the steel all the way on the right side of the picture. Um, and then hanging from the hanging or installed on that structure is our um, interim cryogenic propulsion stage umbilical. So that's kind of centered across the, the middle of the picture. You see a, a steel frame and you see a lot of piping and you see some umbilical lines hanging off the front of that. Um, it, it's hard to get scale in pictures like this, but that's a 75,000 pound umbilical, um, about 30 feet tall, so kind of the size of a three-story building. And that's the interface to the second stage of the rocket. You can see the umbilicals draped across to another structure, and you see some, some orange there. The, the orange is actually um, simulating the second stage skin, so in other words, that outer mold line. Um, and that's the place where the ground um, connects up to the, to the flight. And, and that orange skin is attached to a vehicle motion simulator. So that vehicle motion simulator um, can move, and it basically simulates the movement of the rocket, both while we're transporting it out on, a, on the crawler transporter, um, and then also the first few, um, really parts of it, the first few milliseconds of a launch. And I'll show you in a minute um, what that looks like when this vehicle motion simulator actually simulates a launch and how this umbilical works. But before I do that, the other thing I wanted to point out is that launch equipment test facility is a really busy place. So there's one more structure on the left of the vehicle motion simulator. Um, it looks like kind of like a hooded steel structure. That's the um, LOX or the liquid oxygen tail service mast umbilical. And that's another 30 foot tall umbilical. And that's the one that we use to um, both fuel and to drain the core stage. So that's, a, again, another three story building just to give you a, a sense of scale. So I'm going to see now if um, I'm able to. Yeah, I may not be able to run the video using this. So I, let me go back one. 
So um, what, what, what would happen here if, if we showed the video, the, um, the vehicle motion simulator? I don't think I can do that. Can you guys click on it up there? Yeah, what, what you'll see is the vehicle motion. There you go. The vehicle motion simulator pops up. You see all of the umbilicals snap back um, into the nets. And then you see the swing arm swing off to the right. And what we're doing is we're getting all of those umbilicals out of the way as the launch vehicle, um, as launch vehicle accelerates out of the launch pad. Will you run it one more time just to give folks a chance to see it? So watch, you'll see the vehicle motion simulator. You see the umbilicals pop back into nets. Then you see, the, uh, you see it, it swing off. And we test all of our umbilicals over in this launch equipment test facility. We're right now in the middle of the campaign um, to test those. We've just got a few left. This is the second stage umbilical. And then we've got the two tail service mast umbilicals. And then we've got a vehicle stabilizer system. And as we finish those, um, we take all the umbilicals over to the mobile launcher and, and we install them. Okay, so mobile launcher. So this is um, the, the platform and the tower that provides structural support to the launch vehicle and to the spacecraft. Um, it, it looks like a lot of steel, and it, and it is. Um, this, is, this tower is 370 feet tall and it weighs about 10 and a half million pounds when it's fully outfitted with, with all the ground support equipment. What you don't get a sense for is the complexity inside the mobile launcher. It, it is an absolute maze of um, the ground systems that we've got. So this is our, you know, our direct interface from the ground to the flight. So this is how we fuel. Um, we, this is how we get power to it. This is how we provide purges. This is how we get data off of it. Um, and so it is, it's an absolute maze. We've probably, uh, we ha not probably, we have over 800 um, EGSE or electrical ground system equipment racks, um, fluids panels, um, pneumatics panels, and so forth. We have 120 miles of cabling on this mobile launcher. It, it is a very, very complex um, piece, of, piece of hardware. Um, the picture on the right, you see us, um, you can't see the crane, but there's a crane li lifting the forward skirt umbilical for installation onto the tower. We've, so far, we have installed the booster umbilicals, the forward skirt umbilical, the inner tank umbilical, um, and soon, as we finish up the second stage umbilical and the tail service mass umbilicals, we'll bring those over as well. So we're making great progress. This has been a very complex job. Um, it's taken a little longer than, than we'd wanted to, but we're getting towards the end now. We're really, we're in the hard part, and we think um, by April of next year we'll have this work done, um, and then we'll roll the mobile launcher out to the pad and then over to the VAB for our um, integrated verification and validation tests. Let's see. This is a picture inside the vehicle assembly building, so everybody is very, I think, familiar with the, what the outside of the vehicle assembly <coughs> building looks like. That's, you know, that's kind of the, our iconic... Um, building it at Kennedy that really defines our, our skyscape, our landscape. Um, it's 500 feet tall, so it's almost as tall as the Washington Monument. It's got four bays, e each large enough to hold a Statue of Liberty. Um, of course, we don't use it for Statues of Liberties. We use it to process launch vehicles and spacecraft. So we're, we're busy working in High Bay 3, which is where we're going to process SLS and Orion. And this is a picture from inside High Bay 3, or really two pictures. The picture on the left shows the 10 levels of work platforms that give us access to various levels of SLS and to Orion. Those work platforms are all installed. And this is one half. You can kind of, if you look at the cutouts on the platforms, you can see the outer mold line of the vehicle. There's another set of 10 on the other side of the high bay, and these, and these um, platforms um, are pushed together and they extend and retract um, around the, the SLS and Orion so that we can process and we can reach it with our ground systems. So the, the platforms are all in place. Um, we're finishing up some, some punch list work that we've got. Um, probably the one thing that we still have a little bit of work to go on is our fire suppression system, but we're getting close on that. Um, and this work will be complete when the, um, when the mobile launcher rolls in for integrated verification and validation once it's complete um, with its construction and installation phase. A neat thing about the, the VAB platforms is you can move them up and down 10 feet, and you can also change out. Um, they have inserts in each one so that you can, cha you can change the outer mold line that you're trying to deal with. So as the SLS evolves, we'll be able to move these platforms to different places, put in different inserts, and, and use these same 10 platforms. Um, and it, it, theoretically, it could also support other launch vehicles if you brought another launch vehicle in with a different outer mold line. Okay, launch pad 39B. So this is where we're trying to get to. Um, again, a, a lot of construction work is already complete. The, the picture on the left, and, and like the VAB, at launch pad 39B, this is, you know, we've used this through the Apollo program, through the shuttle program. Now we're getting ready to use it for SLS and Orion. The, the picture on the left, you're looking from south to north through the flame trench of the pad. I probably noticed a couple things. The shuttle fixed service structure 
um, has all been removed. We have now what we're calling a clean pad concept, which means basically this, this launch pad could be used for multiple kinds of vehicles. It makes it more flexible and adaptable um, for us. Basically, you bring your own mobile launch tower with you, and that provides the, the ground interface. So it, it's more um, adaptable than, than how we had it configured, where it was solely for a, you know, a single shuttle. Now we'll be able to use it um, for Block 1, also Block 1B, and future evolutions of the SLS and possibly other um, launch vehicles as well. So looking south to north, what you can see is steel structure kind of in the middle of the page. That's the foundation for the um, flame deflector. Um, we're, get, we're getting ready to install the flame deflector metal plates. They're going to kind of be like shingles on a house. So each plate is um, four feet by five feet by three inch of steel. And we will um, layer those across the flame deflector. It's a little bit hard to see, but then as you extend out to the north on the left side of the flame trench, you can see the bricking that is already complete. About 100,000 bricks form the, form the flame trench. Um, this project's getting close, and we'll finish that up this year. On the right is a picture. It's really of our whole LH2 system, but the, the new project here is in the foreground. That's an LH2 separator tank that takes um, LH2 that's bleeding off, off the vehicle during that that's been used for the engine cooling process, and we turn the liquid into vapor before we ship it out to the um, flare stack, which is about halfway through the, through the page. Okay, let's see. Then the launch control center. So this is firing room one inside our launch control center. This is the room that we're gonna use for our, this is our launch processing system. This is where our engineers will sit when they're doing the test and checkout. Um, in the vehicle assembly building and out at the launch pad. You can see from the picture here that all the hardware is in place and the team is really busy working on the software. There are two major elements of the software that we're working on. One is the operating system, if you will, that um, takes all of the telemetry off of the vehicle and provides it to the engineers and to the application software, the displays that we have. Um, the, let's see, the, the other thing it does is it provides the command and control interface out to the launch vehicle into the spacecraft. So, we, so we, we both have the ability to monitor and we also have the ability to send commands. That's what that application software, the second set of software that we have does. We've, uh, we've finished a lot of the software. We're right now testing one of our major releases. It's the first release that provides all of the interfaces um, to the rocket. So this is the first time we've had the SLS, the Orion, and the ICPS interface all capability in our software. Um, we're testing that out, then we turn it over to the applications team and they'll develop those displays and those procedures that go on with it. This will be work that will extend through most of 2018, so we'll be getting this done just in time. And from a program standpoint, this one is our critical path. We're working hard to make sure that we stay off of the overall enterprise critical path. Okay, that's my last slide, so I'm going to turn it over to John Honeycutt and he'll talk about SLS. <laughs> Let's try it now. Our next speaker will be John Honeycutt. John Honeycutt is man manager of NASA's Space Launch System Program at NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center. He's responsible for directing the Space Launch System Program activities leading to the development of America's deep space rocket for human and scientific exploration. In that capacity, John leads a nationwide workforce of more than 4,200 civil servant and contractor personnel with an annual budget of just over two billion dollars. And John Honeycutt is a charger. He graduated from the University of Alabama Huntsville with a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering. Go Chargers. And uh, John, we look forward to hearing your remarks this morning. Thank you, Dale. Um, I, I will tell you that we love to get students down to see the hardware and we look forward to accommodating you on a future engine test and seeing uh, anything else you want to go see. Yeah, well, uh, and as you might expect, there's a good buzz on the bus going down, and then as students would do, everybody crashes on the way home. Oh, so. yeah, <laughs> I understand. Hey, so, uh, and, and Mr. Wofford, who's the engine element manager uh, in his Aerojet Rocketdyne team, are always they always do a great job bending over backwards to accommodate. It's a, it's a big deal to show off our progress. So, uh, I'll go to the next chart. Uh, what you see here uh, in the in the larger image is is one of our RS-25 engine tests at the at the Stennis Space Center. This one was back in the summer. Um, we were fortunate enough to actually get some some guys that fly uh, drones and get some imagery. 
they were out of the Kennedy Space Center, and uh, we captured a, a, a nice rainbow during the test, and that was pretty cool. I think that's the first time we ever were able to see that. Uh, and then in, in the inset image, uh, those are the four RS-25 engines that, that will be uh, integrated with the core stage at MAF uh, for the EM-1 flight. So we've, we've got all four engines ready to go. They're actually uh, in, in storage today and, and, and ready to support EM-1. And so the engine team is, is really off uh, uh, closing up some of their certification paperwork for EM-1 and they continue to work uh, activities associated with future flights and, and production of, of the new RS-25s and I'll say a few other things about that. Uh, we've, we've been doing hot fire testing uh, on RS-25 at Stennis uh, since 2015. Uh, I, I guess some folks could ask why, why are you doing so much testing? Uh, you know, even though this is this engine is a proven workhorse, uh, we're using it in some different environments uh, than it was initially designed for, and so we we had to go do some testing uh, to take care of some verification work for for things like uh, different pre-launch conditions. You know, Mike talked about uh, uh, his his bleed system at the launch pad in in the previous configuration. Uh, we didn't have that. We used recirculation pumps on on the engines, and so we've had to go do some testing to to get the data we needed to uh, be able to get our certification for that that part of the system. Uh, the engine's got higher heating environments. It's got uh, higher thrust profiles, uh, and also we've uh, we have developed a new engine controller. Uh, the the engine controller. Uh, was a new development. Uh, it's uh, it's lighter weight, so it's get, it's 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 able to save us some mass that we can uh, put towards payload. Um, engine controller uh, has, with its challenges, like anything through development, has has come along nicely, and we've got all the the controllers certified along with the engines for for EM1, and then we've got some actually certified for EM2, and so. Uh, we're well we're well on the way there and we had our uh, final hot fire test for this year uh, just just a few weeks ago it was actually last Thursday not, not a few weeks ago and uh, that's that's a test uh, where we actually tested a, a newly built RS25 it's the first first newly built one uh, so it got its green run along with a, a controller that'll fly on a, on a future mission uh, the, the controller is probably one of the biggest technology upgrades uh, using state-of-the-art components uh, for the engine. Uh, the engine guys and, and their Marijet rocket diner are also doing concurrent work uh, relative to the manufacture of of our new RS-25s that will come in it eventually come into the fleet. Uh, you know, the RS-25 uh, in its previous life was uh, a reusable engine uh, now it's not reusable so we're able to take advantage of that and integrate some uh, design changes as well as take take advantage of state-of-the-art manufacturing uh, like uh, 3 3d printing or advanced manufacturing and uh, i think one of the next tests series we got planned, we'll, we'll start integrating some of those advanced manufactured parts into the test program. Um, so all that said, uh, the, the goal there is affordability and reduce, reduce the cost of the RS-25 and we've got a, we've got a, we got a really good plan and our, and we're, we're, we're on target for our initial goal, uh, of about a 30% reduction in, in cost for the RS-25. And then uh, the center, Marshall Space Flight Center, does they play we we play a key role in in the work that's going on relative to advanced manufacturing. Uh, let's see, talk a little bit about booster now. Uh, what you what you see in this picture is the is uh, the QM2 test uh, out in Utah at Orbital ATK's facility back in 
June of 2016. And then there in the inset, uh, you can see we got booster production continuing uh, at orbital ATK's facilities out in Utah. Uh, and in the inset there, they're, they're applying some of, the, some of the markings on some of the completed segments and, and finishing up those and getting ready for storage. Um, I'll tell you that out at ATK in Utah, we're, we're casting segments at a pretty steady pace. Uh, we've, we've got enough for the first flight. Five of those have been completely painted and moved into storage and where they're awaiting shipment to the Kennedy Space Center. Uh, we've also got uh, four segments that are currently de designated for the, for the second mission. Uh, we've, got, we've got those cast. Uh, booster is, uh, it's, an, it's another thing kind of like uh, the RS-25. You can look at it on the outside and see not much has changed other than we've added, added a fifth segment to it. Uh, but there, there's been uh, additional upgrades to the booster as well. We've, we've, we've had to go to an asbestos-free uh, insulation, and that's, that's created uh, some, some workforce in, in a development area there. Uh, the booster has new avionics and as well as a, a new nozzle design. And so we've, we've, uh, we have completed uh, two full-scale static hot-fire tests uh, that paved the way for the qualification of the motor. And uh, the first test we did was back in March of 2015, and the one you see here was in June of 2016, as I stated earlier. Uh, the first test, we, so the way we do those tests, we do one at the at the uh, extreme cold environment, uh, which was the one in June at about at 40 degrees, and then the one back in 2015 we did at 90 degrees. Um, both the nozzles have been installed on their aft segments, and then uh, we we do our our aft skirt and forward skirt uh, refurbishment and build up uh, at our facility at the Kennedy Space Center, and all that all that work's going on today as we speak to support EM1. And then uh, big effort by the team to uh, get through their avionics qualification testing, and that was done uh, here at the Marshall Space Flight Center in our SEAL lab. Talk a little bit about core stage. Uh, those that have been keeping up with the rocket, and Todd kind of alluded to the, some of the challenges we've had on core stage with the welding, and uh, it's our big new development. Uh, so what you see in the in the in the right image here is is the engine section structural test article coming off uh, the Pegasus bars that, that Todd referred to a few minutes ago. Uh, as, as he stated, we've we're into the throes of, of running uh, the ultimate cases. We completed one and and plan to get the second ultimate test case done next week. Uh, that'll wrap up uh, the primary objectives. We'll, we'll get into some margin testing. The benefit of the margin testing there is, is to be able to uh, figure out uh, for future builds where we may be able to, to, to buy back some, some mass. And then uh, in, the, in the left image, uh, you'll see the manufacturing facility down at the Michoud Assembly facility. Uh, those are, you kind of get to see all in one picture there, the, all the big, most of the big components of, of the core stage in the left back uh, in, in what we call the vertical assembly center, which is our big weld tool. Um, you'll see one of the, one of the tanks that's in, in process there and then in the right front uh, is almost an identical tank to that. That's uh, the liquid oxygen structural test article, which will be uh, one of the next elements that makes its way uh, from MAF to Marshall for a, a structural qual test that's similar to the, the one we're doing on the engine section now. And then in the right back is uh, the liquid hydrogen structural test article, and that's it's in, our, in the wash facility. And so it's 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 getting washed out there, and, it, and where it's and then it gets ready for prime. Get, and then uh, in the middle of the floor is the the liquid the liquid oxygen flight tank, and so uh, it's been built and ready. So uh, what I, 
what I can tell you is all the all the structural test articles uh, have been completed and they're getting their uh, test interfaces installed on them and getting prepped for shipment uh, up to Marshall for testing and then uh, all the all the welding on the structural elements uh, for the core stage for the first flight have been completed and they're in some sort of uh, outfitting and getting ready for to move over into integration. Uh, another uh, important thing that we've we've done, and it's one of those things that uh, that, that I, I think if I don't we don't pay enough attention to it, it might bite us, and so we are. And we we've invested in what we call a core stage pathfinder, and it's it's a uh, it's a kind of a test article that we built uh, with the right mass and CG and uh, mold line so that uh, we can use it to, uh, uh, for checkout in the factory, uh, but even more beneficial uh, to the enterprise will be uh, practicing using it for loading the, the ultimately loading the core stage into the stand at Stennis for the green run and then and then Mike, it's really important to Mike to get it down into the, down at the Kennedy Space Center and have it in the VAB um, so he can do his checkout work work there. So uh, it's, a, it's a big deal as far as risk mitigation goes for us there. And uh, I've, I've seen some pictures of it, and it's uh, stage is big. The, uh, the last big piece of the... Of the SLS uh, in the inset here, you'll see the uh, launch vehicle stage adapter that uh, was fabricated here at the Marshall Space Flight Center. Uh, it's been primed and it's it's getting ready for its application of uh, thermal protection spray. And then uh, in the larger image is our interim cryogenic propulsion stage, which will be uh, the upper stage for the EM-1 mission. Uh, it's it's it comes from our our neighbor across the river, ULA Indicator, and it's made its way to the checkout center down at Kennedy and then ultimately been moved over to, to storage at the space station processing facility. Um, so all that all that's going really well. The, uh, the Orion stage adapter, uh, which connects us to my friend Mark here, uh, it's, it's nearing completion. We're in the process of getting it outfitted with uh, bracketing and, and cables uh, for our secondary payloads, and so, and then uh, I guess our, the la the first big structural test we actually did this year was uh, was on the that, that upper stage uh, adapter configuration, and uh, it made its way through the test series in flying colors. So uh, overall, making good progress. I don't think uh, I'm ever as happy as. Uh, I could be. Uh, it, we got we got challenges, and uh, I, I do I do see progress, and uh, we're in we're in good shape to move on to green run, eventually, and then on to launch. That's all I had, Dale. All right, thank you, John. <laughs> okay, uh, could you hit the clicker one more time and then hand it to Mark? Yeah, I figured, Mark, that might help you work your way through your pitch. So uh, Mark Kirisich is our next speaker. He's manager of NASA's Orion program. As Orion program manager, Mark is responsible for the design, development, and testing of the Orion spacecraft, as well as spacecraft manufacturing that's underway at various locations across the country and in Europe. Mark is a native of Chicago, and he received a bachelor's degree in electrical engineering in 1982 from the University of Notre Dame and a master's degree in electrical engineering in 1983 from Stanford. And Mark, so I just have to ask, when Notre Dame plays Stanford later this season, who do you pull for? Yeah, it, it depends if my boss, Ellen Ochoa, is in the room or not. So <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Ellen is a J Johnson Space Center Center Director, and she's from Stanford, but usually I root for Notre Dame. All right. Well, Mark, fill us in on the progress of Orion. Yeah, Dale, thank you very much, and uh, good morning. I will go to my first chart. This is Orion. We have uh, three major flight elements. We have the launch abort system, uh, the crew module is in the center. The crew module is where 
The astronauts will live and work as they travel to destinations that are further into space than, than we've ever gone before. And the third element is, is the service module. The service module provides our propulsion capabilities and also electrical generation. Propulsion is really key. Um, it's John's upper stage that actually we, we do a maneuver while we're in low Earth orbit and sends us on our way to these destinations, to the moon, for example. But once we get to the destinations and we want to go into orbit there, it's the service module that puts us into these orbits. And then when we've performed our mission, sends us, begins, begins our journey back to Earth. Uh, we've, uh, we've flown two test flights today that have demonstrated, first of all, the launch abort system. We did a pad abort test where we proved that the launch abort system can take can take the uh, crew module and accelerate it away from some bad situation on the launch pad. Uh, then in December 2014, we, we put the crew module through its exercises. We sent it on into the most energetic orbit a spacecraft built for humans has been sent on since the end of the Apollo program. And both of those tests went really well. On Exploration Mission 1, uh, it, will not be, it will not only be Orion's first flight on, on John's space launch system, but also it will be the first flight of our service module. And, and today I'll show you a couple of pictures, but all three of these elements are well into their manufacturing uh, processes and testing processes. And, and Dale mentioned, not only here in, in the United States, we have, we have over 800 companies across the United States that provide parts that get assembled. Uh, primarily at the Kennedy Space Center, but also in Europe. About 200 different companies across Europe provide parts, primarily for the European service module, and it's being assembled in, in Bremen, Germany. This first picture, this is, these, these are two of our abort motors. They are part of the launch abort system. Our launch abort system actually has three solid rocket motors, three new solid rocket motors. The jettison motor, which we use every single flight, it's what pulls the launch abort system off the crew module when its mission is complete. Uh, the attitude control motor, which provides directional steering capability during abort, and, and the two motors you see here, one, one per launch. And these are, these are the big motors. They're about a half million pounds of thrust each. We hope we never have to use them because if we have to use them, it means there's been a bad day. But We've proven they work very effectively. On, on the pad abort one test, we demonstrated that if you're starting from a standstill on the launch pad, it accelerates the crew module from zero to over 500 um, miles per hour in just a little over four seconds. And, and the two you're seeing here, the one on the right is the Exploration Mission 1 launch abort system, and the one on the left is the Exploration Mission 2 launch abort system. We pour them actually in pairs as an affordability measure. Uh, this is our crew module, our Exploration Mission 1 crew module. The photo was taken actually late spring, early summer. It's, it's in the proof cell uh, in our factory in the ONC building in Florida. And what we, what we use the proof cell for is after we're done welding together the fluid systems. And the fluid systems on Orion are both the propulsion system, uh, which, which takes the fuel and the oxidizer from the tanks to the jets, and also the ECLIS system, which, which distributes fluids and oxygen and air uh, to the spacecraft. Uh, we, there are actually over 600 different tubes that have to be, tube segments that have to be welded together, and then we put the tanks in. You, you can see several of the tanks in the picture there. After everything's assembled, we, we roll the crew module into this proof cell, and then we shut those big doors you see there. And it's a very thick door, it's very thick walls, because what we do is we pressurize uh, we pressurize uh, the system past its, its maximum expected operating pressure. There's quite a bit of energy in the system, and we make sure it's leak tight. And that, and that test, which we did earlier this summer, went extremely well, so we're completely done with the fluid system. And since that time, we've been busy ex installing and testing avionics, all of the computers and the navigation equipment. And, and we, started, we turned the spacecraft on. We turned the Exploration Mission 1 spacecraft on for the first time in August of this year. Uh, since that time, we have had about 500 hours of powered on testing. We were interrupted for just a couple of days as the hurricane uh, went through the area. But the, the, team, the testing's been going so well, and, and there's been so few flags uh, that we actually made up the seven days we had to, we had to power down uh, for the hurricane and, and save the system. But we'll complete that testing in, in November, 
And, and when that's done, we put, the, we put the crew module through a series of environmental tests at, at the Cape, and then we put some of its TPS materials on the back shells and the heat shield. And then after that, we should be ready. We should be ready for the service module when it arrives from Germany. And the, the crew module should be done for Exploration Mission 1 about uh, February or March or next year. And in, in fact, in Michoud, in Michoud as we speak, uh, actually the first components, the first seven components associated with the Exploration Mission 2 crew module are arriving there. We're beginning the welding of that spacecraft. This picture I had to include, this is the, a picture of our heat shield. And the heat shield, when I first joined the program, I said, how hard can this structure be? But I didn't fully appreciate. This is actually one of the most highly engineered systems on the spacecraft. It has two big functions. First of all, it has to protect the spacecraft and its inhabitants during reentry from these, from these distant places, from these really large energy orbits. The, uh, the material on the heat shield uh, heats up to over 4,000 degrees uh, during reentry, and it's an ablative material, which means we boil it off. That's how it cools itself uh, dur during reentry, so the material actually boils away. And then once we get through the, the really heavy heating part of it, we have to land, and we land in the water. And because we plan for all sorts of condi uh, contingencies, including one of our parachutes fail and worst case weather conditions, the structure is actually designed to take the brunt of landing uh, at, at 40 miles per hour. So you can imagine this, the crew module weighs about as much as a school bus. You can imagine the energy of a school bus uh, having an impact at 40 miles per hour. So we have a really strong titanium skeleton underneath uh, the tile blocks you're looking at there. I'll also mention this is the first time that we, we've gone to the tile architecture. It's a, it's a five meter uh, diameter heat shield. And the material we use is something called Avcoat. It's the material that, that, that boils away during reentry. We, for exploration flight test one, we made it monolithic, but we found it's really challenging to build a single piece of Avcoat that big on EFT-1. We had cracks. So we tried this architecture on, on, on this flight. It's the first time we've done it, and it's, and it's proven really it's going to give us a number of advantages. We can, we can manufacture the blocks ahead of time. It comes together quicker. So, so far, uh, this, this heat shield is coming together really well. And now we'll go across the ocean. And this is a picture from the Airbus factory in Bremen, Germany. This is our service module. And uh, I, I mentioned its primary function. It will have four large tanks, two, fu two for fuel, two for the oxidizer. It will hold a total of about 40,000 pounds, 20, about 20,000 pounds each of, of the fuel and oxidizer. And this, this again, is this what puts us into orbit and, and gets the crew home safely. There's actually three different kinds of thrusters on this. We have a main engine. We have a backup engine on the main. It's a, it's a, it's a different kind of engine. It's aux thrusters, smaller aux thrusters, but that back the main engine up, and then we have an attitude control system. Uh, in addition to that, the service module provides our electrical power uh, throughout the mission. There are a total of four solar arrays that generate about 16 kilowatts of power uh, during flight. The, the assembly of this spacecraft is also coming along really well. We have, I mentioned, about 600 welds to do. They have over 1,000, 1,100 welds to connect. And that's, by the way, just the prop system. There's about another 400 for its environmental control system, so well over 1,500 welds that we're about 90% complete with. And as soon as their welding is complete here in another month or so, similar kind of process will take place in Bremen. They'll proof test the system, and then, and then we will start installing the avionics boxes later this year. And this spacecraft should, should get on an airplane and will be flown to the Kennedy Space Center uh, sometime in the summer of next year, 2018. It's getting really close. <coughs> Thank you. Dale, back to you. All right. So uh, as many of you can relate to, you know, uh, staying up into the wee hours of Christmas morning, those uh, dreaded, that dreaded phrase, some assembly required. <laughs> All right. Now, Bill Hill is the uh, Deputy Associate Administrator for Exploration Systems Development uh, in the NASA Headquarters Human Exploration and Operations Mission Directorate. In this role, Bill rides herd 
uh, on, on these cats. Uh, and he provides uh, leadership uh, for the development of the exploration systems, uh, Space Launch System, Orion, and the Ground System Development Program. And what I was alluding to, the overall systems integration. Uh, Bill Hill holds a Bachelor of Science in Mechanical Engineering from the University of West Virginia. Uh, excuse me, West Virginia Institute of Technology. I read that too quickly, Bill. That's okay. And uh, also has an MBA from Frostburg State University. So Bill, tell us how all this is gonna come together. All right, thanks Dale. Good morning, everyone. Um, let's see, we move right along here. I just wanna kind of give you an overview of how we're gonna pull all this together, these foundational components for uh, deep space human exploration, the Space Launch System, Orion spacecraft, and the ground systems that are definitely required to process and, uh, and, uh, and launch uh, the integrated vehicle. Our nation's goal is to expand human presence into our solar system, and that's what we're trying. That's what we're planning to do. That NASA is going to lead that effort, and and we'll press out into the solar system. Uh, we've been talking about. Uh, you've heard proving ground and and uh, and so forth. We've kind of in the last year uh, moved that down to a phased approach. Uh, phase zero basically is today on the International Space Station. It's a, it's a great laboratory. It's a great uh, place to do technology development, to prove out our life support systems, increase our reliability on life support systems so we can take them out uh, to deep space. Because once we press out beyond, uh, beyond the lunar vicinity, it's basically a one-way trip, and everything's got to make it. Uh, is there's really no no way to turn back. Phase one, we're planning a, uh, uh, what we call the deep space gateway in the cislunar area, and I'll go into that a little bit more, but basically a platform where we can practice, where we can demonstrate our capabilities, where we can expand up to 42 days of, uh, of operations in deep space and work toward uh, the next phase, which would be phase two, uh, the deep space uh, transport and that would be, and I'll get into that too, that would be the actual Mars class uh, transportation vehicle that will support a crew uh, to go to the uh, Martian vicinity. And then into the 30s with uh, phase three and four, uh, going actually out to the Martian uh, vicinity and, and eventually uh, to the Martian surface. Uh, these are the building blocks, as I told you, launching uh, from Kennedy, uh, modernized Kennedy. We've, we've invested a lot of, uh, a lot of money into uh, building the infrastructure, as Mike showed you, uh, integrating the uh, uh, SLS rocket with Orion and demonstrating our commitment and capability to extend human ex existence into deep space. This is a critical next step in charting a new future uh, in space with opportunities for all. And when we say all, um, in the Human Exploration and Operations Mission Director, we have the International Space Station, we have commercial cargo, commercial crew, um, exploration systems development with Orion, SLS, and uh, the ground systems, uh, as well as the uh, space communications and, and navigation uh, network, the deep space network that's going to support the communications. We look at it as an and, not an or. Um, it's going to take all of us to get there, and so we're we're looking at uh, bringing all of that together. Um, our our uh, portfolio of SLS, Orion, and, and the ground systems have vendors in all 50 states. I'm very proud of that. I'm also very proud that we have requirements in our prime contracts where we we expend over 500 million dollars a year with small business, small and disadvantaged businesses. So we are an economic development engine and, uh, and we bring those companies and grow those companies to support what we do. Uh, just quickly going through the exploration mission one, this is kind of, you saw a video of it early on when Dale was talking. Um, we're going to launch as, uh, as we always do from Kennedy Space Center, uh, press out and we'll, uh, like the uh, shuttle program, we'll uh, drop off the uh, solid rocket boosters and uh, and they'll come back down into the ocean and 
remain there forever. Uh, we're not going to retrieve them. Uh, we'll go and after that get through the uh, uh, main engine cutoff with the core stage, expend that, uh, jettison that, and then jettison the uh, uh, launch abort system that uh, Mike or that uh, Mark talked about. Uh, and then we'll be on our way. We'll do a uh, circularization. We'll get into uh, into Earth orbit, um, and then come around and do a, a translunar injection burn uh, to put us on a trajectory. We'll uh, we'll separate from the interim cryo propulsion system, and then uh, on, pretty soon after that, we'll dispense one of thirteen uh, CubeSats that we're going to carry on EM1. Uh, it'll be our first uh, deployment. Uh, we'll, like I said, we'll just deploy six of those. We're kind of flying, not necessarily in, uh, in formation, but uh, the ICPS will be put in a heliocentric orbit and we'll continue on. Uh, it'll go up and around uh, the moon eventually uh, along with uh, Orion. Uh, we'll continue to press on uh, and drop off can't hardly read my thing here. Drop off uh, some additional six uh, CubeSats after the uh, after the burn and continue on around and uh, drop the final three off. Get into uh, uh, the lunar orbit and do a burn to get into our uh, um, our uh, distant retrograde orbit. Um, this will put us into an orbit that can take us out 70,000 kilometers above uh, the moon, the furthest we've ever taken a human-rated uh, spacecraft uh, from Earth. We'll spend some time going around in the, in the uh, DRO um, for a couple of days. We may extend that depending on how our systems work. Um, and then we'll come back around and, and do another burn uh, to get on our way to uh, uh, back to uh, back to the Earth, and and then finally finally land just off of the coast of uh, San Diego, and we'll obviously recover the uh, uh, recover the capsule there. Um, phase one, as I talked about, the Deep Space Gateway. This is kind of a notional uh, illustration of what we're talking about on the uh, on the left. There is the uh, Deep Space Gateway. We'll have a uh, um, solar electric propulsion system uh, on the uh, far left there in the gold. Uh, we're in the process of uh, preparing to procure that. Um, we'll have a habitation module of some sort in the, in, in the middle and then an airlock on the uh, other end to uh, interface wet. I'll show you a, a manifest that uh, we plan to use uh, to build out the, uh, the gateway. Uh, of course, we'll have Orion uh, go to that. Gateway we're going to use for, uh, as I said, for for demonstrating procedures, for demonstrating um, um, activities. We're not going to necessarily human rate uh, this system. Uh, this uh, the gateway in, in uh, with the Orion will be human rated because the Orion is going to be human rated, um, and we're going to be using the ISS uh, class uh, environmental control systems. Where we could, if if we needed, or if we suffered a failure of one of those, we can easily come back in Orion, or at least hang out in, our, in Orion for a bit until we figure out how to fix it. Uh, this is kind of our phase one manifest uh, in the next uh, in the next ten years or so. Uh, we do have Europa on here um, sometime. We're not sure where that's going to end up. It's going to depend on funding for Europa. Our first um, crewed uh, mission, uh, exploration mission two, we intend to take the power propulsion element uh, up and have it deployed after Orion separates uh, from the, uh, from the uh, exploration upper stage. And on top of the exploration upper stage will be a universal stage adapter, uh, which will actually be uh, built here in town. Um, and that universal stage adapter has a We'll have a, cap a large volume and have a capability of eventually getting uh, and taking up a 10 metric tons worth of uh, worth of payload. EM3, we're looking at targeting the uh, habitation module and delivering that with Orion. 
to, uh, um, to join with the uh, power propulsion element, uh, take up on EM4 a, uh, a logistics module of some sort to, ref, uh, to refresh the uh, um, commodities in the, in the HAB, and then on EM5, uh, take up a, uh, uh, an airlock. We also depict in the lower area there the gateway configuration, um, uh, an arm which the Canadian Space Agency is, uh, is partnering with us to, uh, to provide, very similar to what they did with uh, International Space Station. Phase two, the uh, uh, deep space transport. Uh, it's just a notional depiction of what it might look like. Uh, it'll have uh, kind of a hybrid propulsion system of solar electric uh, power as well as uh, some, some uh, chemical propo propellant. Um, we'll uh, outfit it at the gateway and then, uh, and then press on. This is kind of a notional of, our, um, of what we see as uh, the manifest out beyond uh, EM6 taking up, the, uh, um, taking up the deep space transport on a cargo variant of the uh, space launch system, taking it up to the gateway, uh, and then doing a series of logistics um, uh, missions, both uh, with uh, crew and car and a cargo variants to uh, outfit it for a uh, a one year um, test test cruise, calling it a shakedown cruise. Basically, uh, uh, we'll go out in, beyond the lunar uh, vicinity and 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 test it out for a full year, independent of the uh, of Earth and independent of our um, our logistics train. Um, we may also use, in some cases, some of the uh, some of the uh, commercial variants, uh, launch ca uh, launch services to get some of the logistics up there as well. So that's kind of the overview. Um, when we get to the question and answer session, we'll be able to uh, uh, answer any questions. You know, we feel like exploration is critical to pr prosperity and human progress, and we're on we're on a journey to expand human presence into, uh, into the solar system. Um, before I hand it back to Dale, we've got a quick uh, video that we're, we just prepared as an outreach uh, system, and hopefully the, the sound works on this, so we'll uh, see if it plays. I don't know. You guys might have to initiate it up. There is some sound with it, I think. Except there's no sound. I can sing. No, no, no. no. Walk us through it. Do you all have any sound capability? This is actually the, the just right there was the um, um, Orion uh, stage adapter with the uh, CubeSats on. This is kind of an uh, ocean-based test of uh, egress and some of Mike's uh, flame trench activities here. Uh, this is one of the, uh, I think that was the, F, that's one of the F-skirts for the uh, uh, solid rocket booster. The uh, interim propulsion system being transported from ULA over to uh, the uh, Space Station uh, Processing Facility. This is a test at, uh, out in the Gulf of Mexico to, to get out and egress. Uh, the Orion spacecraft getting moved around into the, uh, uh, in the ONC building in a parachute test. Uh, view of our uh, liquid hydrogen tank that was a qual tank getting ready to go to the uh, proof test. One of our engine tests our launch abort test that we did this past summer. Uh, that This is the pathfinder that uh, John was talking about and some of the uh, umbilicals being lifted into place. And then we just have a launch sequence here. My comm person is going to kill me for not having the, <laughs> having the sound with this, but that's okay. There's a roar of the of the launch here. 
And the crowd, yeah. And that's it with that. Thank you very much, Bill. Um, so uh, one, uh, I want to exercise a little uh, moderator discretion before the audience gets to ask. So the progress uh, that was evident in you guys' talks was incredible. And so I'm a believer. I think y'all are going to make 2019, but I do know there is a lot of work to go yet. So I'd just like to ask each of you, and, and Bill, you wait and go last again. Uh, matter of fact, we'll go around this in the same order that y'all talked. Um, what do you see as the next big milestone or next big event, if you will, uh, for everybody to, to be watching in your respective programs okay, between now and launch? Yeah, so for us, yeah, we talked a lot about what we've done to date, but for us, 2018 is going to be a, a really big year. Um, and I can think of maybe three things that I would describe as big things to keep an eye on. One is we're going to finish that mobile launcher. We're going to finish it in April, um, and we're going to roll the mobile launcher out to the pad, and we're going to do a fit check, and then we're going to roll it into the VAB, and we're going to test out all of the ground systems. We'll roll it back out to the pad, and we're going to do the integrated VNV. And so that's going to be going on from, you know, April through the end of 2018. That's going to be a really big deal. Um, you know, we're moving around a, a ten and a half million dollar, or million dollar, ten and a half million pound structure from the pad to the VAB. It, it's going to be really impressive. The other thing for us, we're going to finish our software, um, and software is always something you've got to keep an eye on. We're going to finish that operating system. And we're going to finish all the displays and procedures that our engineers are going to use to test and check out. But both of those things have got to get done before the flight hardware shows up. And then what I didn't talk in my briefing that's going on in the background is the operations team is spinning up. So the operations team today is engaging in the development processes. They're helping us out with our integrated V&V. &V. They're getting upstream. They're, they're in Mark's um, test laboratory in Denver. They're over in the operations and checkout facility um, watching what the Lockheed guys are doing, learning how to power up a, an Orion. They're going to be a part of um, John Honeycutt's green run, and they're going to learn how to do a, you know, a, a fueling sequence. Um, and, and then we're also going through a, a training phase. That some of it's book training, but we also have um, very complicated simulations where the launch team gets in on launch day and we run them through a series of um, problems. They, they work on how to work through those. So for us, 2018 is going to be a really big year, a really exciting year, um, and I think you'll see a lot of progress coming out of Kennedy. All right. Thank you, Mike. John? Yeah, so I kind of view it as two pieces, right? So uh, um, the, we got to get through the big test that we got coming up at the here this year, this is a big year for testing. So that's 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 going to be a big milestone. We've yet to we've got to get through the, the liquid oxygen tank, the the inner tank, and uh, the hydrogen tank, and that's all set to get started or finish uh, sometime over the next year. Uh, but the big visible milestone for the public is when that core stage gets integrated and rolls out of the factory at MAF on the Pegasus and uh, shows up at, at Stennis for the green run. I, I think that's, uh, that'll be extremely impressive. That, that, that's Any idea about when that might happen? I don't want to pin you down too much. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll do the best I can. Yeah. Um, we're working to a schedule today that shows that, that we get the core stage out of the factory in December of 2018 on its way, on its way to MAF. Okay. I'll tell you, there's, um, we have learned that that first-time events in manufacturing create challenges for us. Um, where we get to do them a second time, uh, we usually do pretty good. Um, but but, but we, it, it's a little bit of a learning curve there. So we got challenges, and we got a, we got a great team, and we continue to rise to the occasion and knock All those right. challenges. That'll out. be your Christmas present for next year. Yes. All right. <laughs> Yeah, let's see, Dale, for us, it's crew modules, service module, and our avionics lab. I'll, I'll start with the crew modules. I didn't mention it. We actually have, um, in addition to EM1, EM2, we have the Ascent Abort 2 crew module test article under construction. And coincidentally, both the Exploration Mission 1 crew module and the Ascent Abort 2 crew module will both com be completed approximately of February, March next year. One will be at the Cape, and, and the SN Abort 2 will be shipped to Johnson Space Center for its testing. So we'll be watching that in February and March. In Bremen, uh, we, will, we, we track about 40 large components, these big tanks I mentioned, the pressure control assemblies. We're scheduled to get all of those components to the Bremen factory in, in February next year, 
and complete the welding about March or April next year. So that's what we'll be watching there. And, and Mike brought it up. Uh, it, the pictures aren't quite as flashy and cool, but we have an, uh, an integrated test lab. It's called the, the ITL. It's where we have a really high fidelity representation of the entire spacecraft avionics suite. And we right now are testing the crew module and the service module section separately, bringing out all the bugs, and we bring those together in about April of the next year. So once we have the integrated spacecraft and we load the software, we'll be able to do a full checkout of the spacecraft. So that's going to be a really big event for us. Okay. Thanks, Mark. Bill? Um, for me, it's all the above. Um, we're watching everything. I, I think the the two challenges we had that I think we alluded to was getting the European service module delivered to KSC so we can integrate it with Orion and uh, getting the core stage delivery to Stennis uh, at the end of next year. Um, those are our two critical paths right now and they're kind of neck and neck uh, for getting to a launch date. Um, but the real big one's going to happen in 19 and that's the, when we start integrating the vehicle, start stacking the boosters, start putting the core stage on the boosters and then the uh, interim cryo propulsion system and and the stage adapters and so forth and getting Orion and the last on top of that. So that's what I'm looking at. Okay. Thanks much. All right. Now let's, uh, let's see if anyone in the audience has any questions. Uh, yeah. See one back up top. Uh, Mr. Hill, you mentioned the Deep Space Gateway as a staging area. You mentioned the Deep Space Transport as a way to get from cislunar space to uh, Mars, uh, but the architecture that you showed obviously would only allow uh, missions to the, the vicinity of Mars. What about a lander? Well, we're starting with, uh, we're starting with, you know, we're walking before we run. Eventually, we'll, we'll fold the lander into it. Um, getting the surface uh, infrastructure together for sustained uh, presence on the Martian surface is our long-term goal. Um, but we'll, you know, we'll work on that. We're, we're kind of looking at the next decade and a half or so, uh, defining what that is. Um, the other thing I didn't mention is we're looking at this on pretty much a flat budget of what you see in a line that's about $9 billion within the human exploration and operations budget. That also includes SCAN, that also includes International Space Station, and also includes all the transportation to the state space station. So we're, we're just, like I said, walking before we run, defining the, the, uh, the components to at least get us to the Martian uh, vicinity in a, in a Martian orbit. Um, and then, you know, probably in the next decade, we'll define further landers and so forth for the Martian surface. The other thing we, I didn't mention is, um, you know, we're in the process of working with this administration, and uh, depending on which direction they may want to go, there, there's some kind of a trending to kind of look at uh, th through either commercial ventures or public-private partnerships, um, you know, going to the surface of, of the moon. Uh, so we'll we'll see where we go. That hasn't been defined. We're in the process of a uh, preparing a 45-day study that the uh, administration has asked us for. All right. Let's see, uh, you have another one. Uh, uh, another question for Bill. Um, I'm kind of integrating things that have been set up on this panel over the last few years, and I recall one of the questions or one of the some of the information that came out of a panel like this uh, was. Uh, in response to a question, what's the number one challenge facing deep space exploration or exploration, whatever we were calling it then? The answer was ECLIS. Um, I also heard you today saying that we're going to use ISS class ECLIS as a, uh, as a solution on deep space gateway. I didn't know if you addressed transport systems, but I'd like you to expand on that and help me reconcile those two, uh, two pieces of information. Well, you're, you're correct. It's um, For the gateway, we're, we're going to use kind of current technology that we're using on um, on uh, the International Space Station. We know once we get beyond the cislunar uh, area, we're going to have to have highly reliable um, 
life support systems that aren't going to need any kind of, you know, real maintenance. It's got to be a closed loop system. Um, the, the transport will have what we call Mars class um, ECLIS on it, and we're in the process of developing that. Um, and that's just a fundamental difference. Uh, you know, we'll, we'll, like I said, we'll have Orion for uh, the gateway. It'll be present when any humans are present. Uh, so we'll be relying on, on Orion for our ultimate uh, life support, even though the HAB will have a good level of uh, uh, life support systems. All right. Bill, not picking on you, but I will. Uh, you mentioned the uh, uh, Europa mission in the, in the manifest. Is there any level of planning or configuration definition that you've done there? Well, we'll... It, it, it's going to depend on the science mission directorate and, and what the budget looks like. Um, I know what they what they put in in their submit. Um, unfortunately, it's embargoed, so I can't tell you what it is. But uh, it's it's kind of drifting into the 20s a little further than uh, originally discussed. Um, there is a a very powerful proponent in Congress uh, that may provide some additional funding to bring it back to the left. Uh, but we'll see how that works out. One more if, question. If I could just, one, one thing on that one, that there is a lot of work going on. In fact, we've got a bunch of JPL folks at Kennedy this week um, having a, a three-day TIM kind of talking about what would the ground infrastructure requirements look like. So there's a lot of planning um, around that. Um, so, you know, more work together. So for Mark, uh, here. Oh, sorry. Uh, so what are the challenges of working with international partners with ESA for Orion? Yeah, yeah, a really good question. Um, you know, it, it's a different culture and language and, and the folks are further away. You know, first of all, you, you start with ESA is ESA and their contractors are, have put together some incredible space missions. So we know they can do the job. They built the they built the ATV, which is the, tran the unmanned transfer vehicle that went to the space station. So um, it's, not that they're, it's not that they're not as good or better than us. It's, it's different. And we have to take this, these differences and we have to make a spacecraft uh, that operates flawlessly together. So it's the integration. You know, there's language barriers. And, and I call it injuring cultural differences, the standards, how you, you know, just a, a simple example. How do you inspect a well after you've done the well to prove that there's no flaws in it? We, we over many, many years, have developed, developed certain standards. And guess what? The Europeans have, too. Both are reliable, but they're different. So our experts have to get together and work out the differences. And we, we see that sort of thing in, in, in all the different systems. So you have to work through that. And the time zone difference, the language differences, we speak English in all of our meetings. And that's, I know many of the people we work with, they think in their native language. You can see it happening. But, but they have to communicate it in English, so it takes a little longer. Those sorts of things. But we work through them, and, and you, you, the way you do that is you develop strong relationships. You have to develop trust and, and, and confidence in each other. All right. So, unfortunately, we're just about out of time. Uh, to draw this to a close, I want to ask each of you if you could tell the American people one thing about this new deep space exploration system, what would it be? Give me a one-liner. It's a breathtaking venture. Um, if you see the size of the rocket, we stand at the top of the VAB platforms and look down at how big this rocket is. It's absolutely breathtaking. You imagine how this um, enormous rocket is going to be an amazing asset for this nation. It is really, really exciting to be a part of. I hope you all get a chance to see some of the flight hardware. It literally will take your breath away. All right. John. Um, you see, you asked for a one-liner. Um, let's see. Uh, <laughs> It can be one and a half. That's, that's what Mike did. So, you know, it's a it's a it's a very unique capability. Um, the system in and of itself, and ultimately, you know, it's going to be able to provide us uh, deep space transport that's got a, a, a mass volume and energy capability unlike we've ever had. You know, so it's. And it, it, it'll be the backbone for America's next generation of human exploration, I believe, for the next 30 years. Or more. Or more. Yeah. All right. Mark? Now, Dale, I was 
I was motivated when I was a kid by watching Apollo, by watching the first lunar landing. And many of the people my, that I'm friends with in aerospace, out of aerospace, engineers, doctors, they say the same thing. It's what motivated them to work hard in school and, and achieve great things. And I think it's what made this generation, this generation, make the advances we did. And I think what we're doing, which is going to go beyond Apollo, these missions are going to be incredible. And we're going to motivate the next generation of people to, do, to work hard and to do really great things. All right. Bill. Well, I just want to say that NASA's in it for the long haul. We're in it to lead um, Earth to move human presence out into the uh, into the, our solar system. And these uh, this portfolio of uh, SLS Orion and, and ground systems that support um, are the foundational uh, components uh, to do that. And uh, and we're proud to be working on it. Thanks. All right. Well, guys, thanks. It's been great. I learned a lot. I'm sure I speak for all in the audience when we not only thank you for taking time to come talk to us today, but we really appreciate the work y'all are doing on the exploration systems. Thank you very much. Dale, thank you very much. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm Jim Way. I'm the executive director of the American Astronautical Society. Uh, it is 10 o'clock. We're going to take a quick 15-minute break. Uh, refreshments and uh, are out there in the hall, uh, sponsored generously by Orbital ATK. Thank you. Um, our next session on space policy starts promptly at 10.15. So make your way back in here. And remember, try to come into the middle of the rows if you can, please. Great. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>